show up in the um, actual um, uh, ballot that comes out. We do have handouts. These pros and cons handouts that are out on the table. They give some additional arguments. And then um, I'm going to tell you about some other th ways that you can look for additional arguments besides what we're going to give you tonight. Um, the League of Women Voters of California does uh, advocate on behalf of some of the propositions. They never advocate on behalf of candidates or on behalf of parties, ever. But they do take positions on propositions, and sometimes they even sign their names as one of the official arguments. Um, the local league does not. We sort of stay out of that. But we do um, have the what's called the League Recommends um, on our website. And we also um, uh, will be putting that up on Facebook and such. So if you uh, tend to agree with how the League analyzes these things and, and you want to see why it is that they're recommending some of the um, measures, then you can go on to our website. We're not going to be telling you tonight that we recommend them because that's more advocacy and that's not what we're doing here tonight. So when you do go on our website, there are so many things that you're going to find there that are going to help you with this election. Um, and this blue piece of paper tells you about all of the things that you're going to find. You can register to vote. You can check your registration status. You can find your ballot through an incredible tool called Voter's Edge. And this green paper will tell you all about that. And it's, a, it's a really a remarkable tool that has just come available to us in the last couple of years where you can type in your um, address and it will give you your ballot. So if you have any confusion about whether you're voting for a um, school board position or not, you can always go to your ballot and find out, well, yes, I am, or no, I'm not. The, the most um, wonderful thing about it is that we do ask all of the candidates for all of the uh, positions from senator down to dog catcher um, to submit statements. Uh, tell us who you are and why you're running and what your vision is. So as long as the candidates have agreed to participate, and we're having sort of good luck with that, um, then you'll find their statements on there as well as um, their photograph. You're also going to find out information about the Voters' Choice Act if you don't already fully understand what, that's, what the new way to vote in Nevada County is like. We have lots of information about that as well. Out on the table is the League of Women Voters Easy Voter Guide. That also helps you through these ballot pr propositions. You can also join the League of Women Voters if you want to. We do pretty good work. And um, I know that many in the community are uh, real happy that we've been able to um, put this on. And then we also are, have been able to partner with um, a lot of media who, um, the media aren't going to be asking questions tonight, but they have shown up at all of our candidate forums and have asked questions for which we are so appreciative. And then, of course, um, NCTV and KVMR have broadcast all of our forums. And tonight, we, we are not being broadcast on KVMR, but NCTV is broadcasting this live. And we'll make a, a video available afterwards. So if you want to catch some more of this or pass it along to some of your friends, we're going to make that available on our website. And of course, Nevada County uh, Television will also have it on their website. OK, so tonight. Um, Members of the League of Women Voters have taken responsibility to research uh, one or more of the ballot measures and present them to you. Let me just say as a disclaimer, we are not experts. We are volunteers who have chosen to re do the research because we know that um, not everybody has the time to do the research, nor the inclination. And sometimes hearing it is just a whole lot easier than reading it. So just please bear that in mind, that we are not going to be able to answer every single question that you have. Um, but we have, we have dug a little deeper than most people have at this point um, on all of these measures. We also, by the way, are both men and women. So the League of Women Voters is open to all people. And um, many of our uh, League members, and in, in fact, many of our board members are men. And so um, don't be surprised when you see our men coming up and 
doing their part. We also have a pretty uh, great thing tonight. We do have um, two ballot measures that we feel are um, controversial enough that we wanted to bring in a little spirit, more of a spirited debate, and we have asked members of the Nevada Union um, policy debate team to come in and do a very short debate following our presentation of those uh, those ballot measures. So I'm really looking forward to that. I used to be, a, I had two debaters, and I was the president of the debate boosters, and uh, they are very dear to my heart. So um, it'll give us a little bit of a breather from listening to adults all night long. So looking forward to that. We will introduce them as they come up. Okay, we are going to attempt to um, not take any questions. We want to just zoom through these. If you have questions, we have cards. And please write your questions down on your cards. And then at the end of the evening, we will go through and if we have time, we will address those questions. We also will have everybody up here so that if you want to hang out here a little bit and you want to ask the presenters a little bit more, we will be here. The lights automatically go off at 8.30 in that room, so I would encourage everybody to stay in here if you want to do that, because you'll be able to actually see each other when you're talking. Um, and if you have a question, all you need to do is raise your hand, and we've got people around who will um, come and collect your cards for you. So just write your cards down, write your thing down, raise your hand, and they'll come and get them. Okay, tonight, we have 11 state propositions on the ballot. Propositions 1, 2, and 7 were placed on the ballot by the state legislature, and it's known as a legislative statute. The others were placed on the ballot by supporters who gathered sufficient signatures, and they want to make changes in the state laws and or the California Constitution. So this is known as an initiative statute. Legislative statute comes from the legislature. Initiative statute comes from the people. Okay, Holly, are we ready with the first one? This is going to seem a little bit um, maybe um, simple, but, you know, I actually think that this is really important. I, we just want to do a how to evaluate ballot proposition so that when you are listening to everybody, um, just keep some of these things in mind. And as I was going through it, and I have thought about these things a lot, you know, it actually um, framed some things for me that I thought, ah, that's a, that's a great way to consider it. So very fast. Examine what the measure seeks to accomplish, and do you agree with those goals? Is the measure consistent with your ideas about government? And do you think the proposed changes will make things actually better? Who are the real sponsors and opponents of the measures? Check where the money is coming from. This is really important. And all of those, all of those things that I said were on our website will help you find where the money is coming from, who's supporting these things. Is the measure well written, well written well? Will it create conflicts in the law that may require court resolution or interpretation? Is it good government? Or will it cause problems, more problems than it will resolve? Does the measure create its own revenue source? Does it earmark, restrict, or obligate government revenues? And if so, weigh the benefit of securing funding for this measure against the cost of reducing overall flexibility in the budget. Does the measure mandate a government program or service without addressing how it will be funded? Does the measure deal with one issue that can be easily decided by a yes or no vote, or is it a complex issue that should be thoroughly examined in the legislative arena? If the measure amends the Constitution, consider whether it really belongs in the Constitution. Would a legislative statute accomplish the same purpose? All constitutional amendments require voter approval. What we put into the Constitution would have to come back to the ballot to be changed. Be wary of distortion tactics and commercials that rely on image but tell nothing of substance about the measure. Beware of half-truths. So with that, I would say have your pens and pencils ready to take notes. And I'd like to introduce Stephen Munkelt. He is our first presenter. Stephen is a member of the League of Women Voters. He's on our board, he's an attorney in town, and he's going to do both Propositions 1 and Propositions 2. Good evening. So uh, there are more than one ways that uh, a measure gets to our ballot as an initiative. Uh, one way is through legislative action, and the legislature can place either 
statutory changes or constitutional changes on the ballot. Uh, this election cycle, we have three legislative statutes that are part of the initiative measures. They're, they're Proposition 1 and 2, which are bond measures, and Proposition 7, which has to do with uh, daylight savings time. As it happens, I'm going to do those three legislative statutes. Um, the other primary means of getting something on the ballot as a, as a proposition is uh, by gathering signatures to qualify the measure as an initiative, and that's what uh, most of the others on this ballot are in November. Um, so Proposition 1 authorizes bonds to fund specific housing assistance programs. Um, it authorizes $4 billion in general obligation bonds for existing affordable housing programs for low-income residents and veterans and farm workers and for manufactured and mobile homes, infill, and transit-oriented housing. The fiscal impact would be um, increased state costs to repay bonds averaging about $170 million a year annually over the next 35 years. Now, let me say a little about the general obligation bonds are bonds which are repaid from the state's general budget. Um, and there are three initiatives th on this cycle that, that are that have repayments from the, from the budget, and I'll get to the fiscal impact of those as a general matter in a, in a few minutes. But um, the uh, purpose of the measure is to address a problem with housing in California. The average house in California costs about 2.5 times as much as the national, national average, and the average rent in California for resident space is about 50 percent higher than the national average. And these uh, higher costs, of course, contribute to homelessness and to financial problems for many Californians. You may have seen recently that there's a very high percentage of Californians who pay 50% of their income or more for housing, and that's really, really a challenge. <clears throat> this is a legislative statute uh, initially proposed in Senate Bill 3 of the 1718 legislative session. If passed, the measure allows the state to send, spell, sell, excuse me, $4 billion in general obligation bonds. The proceeds are divided up so that $1.8 billion would go to affordable multifamily housing um, 450 million would go to infrastructure programs, 450 million more would go to home ownership programs, uh, 300 million would go to farm worker housing programs, and an additional $1 billion to veteran home loans. The goal of the measure is to assist people who are struggling for safe and stable housing to, to get a good place to live. The benefits of the programs are focused toward people with income below 60 percent of the median in the area where they live and counties with less than 150,000 population, which of course would include Nevada County and veterans. Now the 60 percent median thing, the, the median is if you take every single person in the community and line them up uh, from the highest income to the lowest income and then you find the person who's in the middle. So it's not you don't have to add up the total income and divide it to get a mean. It's just the person in the middle. So that generally falls a good deal less than 50 percent of the highest person's income. And here, this program is focusing on the folks who are 60 percent or less than that median person, the one in the middle. Um, fiscal impact. The bonds would be repaid with about $170 million a year. And of course, that's an estimate from the state um, legislative analyst and, and budgeting programs controller's office. Um, but that amount would be obtained from the general fund each year, and the payments would last over about a 35-year period until it's paid off. And, of course, the total amount paid will be a good deal more than the $4 billion borrowed originally. The Veterans Home Loan Program, which you may recall is $1 billion of the total $4 billion in bonds, that program is expected to be self-supporting. So it would not add to the cost uh, and, and that uh, which would have otherwise increased the, the payments each year. The state, now the, here's a little bit about the general state of the, uh, the bond debt for the state of California. Uh, because with um, 
Proposition 1, Proposition 3, and Proposition 4 all having bonds which would um, be repaid from the general fund, it's a good idea to have some idea where we stand now. How much do we owe? What is it costing us? What percent of the budget is it? So the state currently has about $83 billion of bond debt from the bonds that are still outstanding after the last 30 years or so. There's an additional $39 billion that has been approved in previous initiative measures, but the bonds have not been sold yet. So assuming that all of those are actually sold so the programs that were approved can be paid um, or initiated, we've got a, a total debt load now that you would calculate as about um, 120 billion dollars. If um, Proposition 1, 3, and 4 all pass, that amount would be increased by 14.4 billion dollars. So to add, you know, roughly 10, 10 or 11 percent to the total state bond debt, um, the current payments on the bond debt, which which is the 83 billion, are about 4 percent of the annual general fund budget. Um, because there are bonds remaining to be sold, it's expected that that percentage would grow somewhat until about 2022, and it would hit a peak and then start to decline after that if no new bond measures are approved. And that peak in 2022 would be about an estimated 4.5% of the general fund annual budget. Of course, that general fund budget amount is also an estimate and it's based on projections about economic performance and, and the taxes that are generated through the economic performance in different segments of our state economy. Um, so these are all figures that are subject to change. For example, in 2007, we had a tremendous economic uh, unsettled position with real estate values, which affected taxes everywhere and created deficit budgeting in California for a number of years. But with the assumptions being made about things continuing on a relatively stable level, in 2022, the bond, current bond debt would be about 4.5% of the annual budget. And if all three of these measures uh, that I mentioned pass in this cycle, that would increase the debt load by about one half of 1% of the total general fund budget. Pros, what's good about this measure? Well, it promotes building affordable homes and apartments. It creates some jobs for people who are building and, uh, and repairing and, and updating uh, the infrastructure and uh, homes and apartments. It helps veterans purchase homes. And again, that portion of this measure would expect to be self-supporting as the vets repay the assistance they got for uh, getting it into the home ownership. And then uh, another pro is that the, the other aspects of the program also have some repayment features or functions. And so that would allow um, additional benefits as, as money is repaid. It could be recycled and help even more people to find housing. The con, in this kind of measure, of course, the primary con is the additional debt that the state incurs and, and uh, how that uh, payment of $170 million a year might affect other programs and things the state would want to do. Support and spending in support. Um, this is a legislative statute, which means that it passed both the state Senate and Assembly. Um, and although, it, although there would have been some lobbying for people who were in favor of this measure and helped propose it and so forth and get it carried through the legislature, it, it's not something like uh, a particular advocacy group that invented a, an initiative measure and circulated the petition. So what we know is the legislature thought this was a good idea. Um, the ballot arguments for the, in favor of this are by groups like Habitat for Humanity, the Disabled American Veterans, Congress of California Seniors, Partnership to End Domestic Violence, People Assisting the Homeless, California Veterans Assistance Foundation. Um, the groups that are registered as uh, providing uh, financial support as committees in favor of this have very cumbersome names because they, they invent the names to try and make a, a particular impression for what they're doing. So one is affordable housing now, yes on Proposition 1 and 2 Coalition, Housing California. That group is the largest uh, financial support uh, registered for this initiative. The, as of the last reporting, they had raised $3.3 million and they still had $2.2 million to spend in running up to the election day. Uh, the other 
listed group or registered group for support was California Homeless and Housing Coalition Action Fund. They raised about $113,000 and had already spent all of that before the last report. Opposition, um, the ballot opposition on this measure is filed by Gary Wesley, who's an attorney. Uh, the name may ring a bell for those of you who look through and try and become familiar with their initiatives because he frequently files opposition arguments when there's no organized opposition. Uh, to this measure, his primary concern is the debt that is created by this measure. Uh, there's no committee opposing it, so there's no spending opposing it. Um, what does your vote mean, or what does this mean for your vote? A yes vote means the state will sell $4 billion in bonds to fund creation and access to affordable housing and assist veterans in purchasing homes. A no vote means no funds will be raised for the proposed programs. Now, it happens that I also have Proposition 2, and you may recall that one of the committees here was the yes on one and two, so they're, they're kind of joined in the support. This is also a legislative uh, statute uh, proposal on the, on the ballot. Um, Proposition 2 would amend the Mental Health Services Act to fund No Place Like Home program. Put that in quotes, the No Place Like Home program, uh, which finances construction and repair of housing for individuals with mental illness. It ratifies, this measure would ratify the No Place Like Home program, and I'll explain that a little more later. Uh, the fiscal impact, um, it would raise um, $2 billion through the sale of uh, bonds, and uh, that would um, require payments of about $140 million per year. But in this bond measure, the obligation is not attached to the general fund. Remember I said one, three, and four, I think, are the, are the general fund bond measures. Two would repay the funds from the money raised by the Mental Health Services Act. So it comes from something other than the general fund. And the, the status quo is the Mental Health Services Act was uh, Proposition 63 in 2004, and it was established uh, to have um, additional money available to help people with serious mental illness. Most of that money goes to the counties because it's the counties that administer mental health programs. Um, the, the legislature passed the No Place Like Home Act, um, and that act is intended to finance permanent housing for the metal, mentally ill, and the way it was, was written and passed by the legislature it pays for itself by taking money away from the money that was created by Prop 63 in the Mental Health Services Act. So because of that borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, part of the funding uh, source, uh, that uh, measure, the, the No Place Like Home Act, is being challenged in the courts. And it's not yet clear whether the courts would approve diverting the money from Prop 63 to pay for the services that would be under the bond for pro this year's Proposition 2. Okay, so this is a legislative statute passed f through the legislature, which of course is trying to support the funding for the measure it already passed and that's being challenged in the court. Um, if passed, it allows the state to sell $2 billion in bonds to fund the No Place Like Home program, and the pro proceeds would be dispersed to build and rehabilitate housing for those with mental illness who are homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. The goal of the measure is to assist people with mental illness who are experiencing homelessness in finding stable, safe housing. Fiscal impact. These bonds would be repaid about $140 million a year from the funds that were raised through the MHSA, the Mental Health Services Act. Um, the pros, promotes building and rehabilitating housing for those with disabling mental illness. It creates jobs by increasing home and apartment construction and infrastructure projects. The con is what you probably already guessed. It diverts funds away from under other mental health services which are being funded currently from Prop 63. And let me give you a little more information than we have on the slide about that. Um, what Prop 63 did in 2004 was impose a an additional 1% income tax on people in California who have income of more than $1 million in a year. And believe it or not, 
that 1% tax on people with income over $1 million raises over $1 billion a year, somewhere between $1 and $2 billion, depending on the year. And that money currently is uh, distributed primarily through the counties for different mental health services. And some counties have chosen to have housing programs as part of their services. So there is some housing support that's available through local control and the choices that are made in the, in the 58 different counties. Okay, next slide. Um, what passed the legislature, so we know that's how it got here. Um, the ballot arguments in favor are by the Mental Health America of California, Mental Health America of California, sorry, California Police Chiefs Association, National Association of Social Workers, and the American College of Emergency Physicians. Uh, spending, the committees that are uh, registered to support this group include Affordable Housing Now, which I mentioned previously, and of course, they're covering both Proposition 1 and 2, and that's the one that raised 3.3 .3 million and has 2.2 .2 million on hand. And the other I also mentioned in connection with Proposition 1, which is the California Homeless and Housing Coalition Action Fund that raised about $113,000 and had spent all of it at the time of the last report. Uh, ballot arguments opposing are from the National Alliance of Mental Illness, uh, NAMI, if you're familiar with them, and it was the Contra Costa chapter that, that actually filed the arguments opposing, and there's no financial committee connected with opposition to Proposition 2. And that, um, like uh, Proposition 1, the what does your ballot mean or what does your vote mean here is, is relatively straightforward. It's not where, it's, this is not one of those where yes means no and no means yes. So your yes vote means the state will sell $2 billion in bonds, which will be repaid from uh, payments of about $140 million, 140 million a year from the Proposition 63 funds. And a no vote means that no place like Home Act would be unfunded. So it wouldn't take place unless the current court action is resolved in favor of diverting the funds from the uh, MHSA. I think that's the last slide for two, isn't it? Yeah. Next. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, prop three, that's Star Carroll. Star is a local gal and member of the League of Women Voters and has been out registering people to vote. Good evening. Proposition 3 is one of the uh, initiative status uh, statutes, uh, meaning that it was uh, created by citizens that uh, thought this would be a good idea to put forward. Uh, it would issue $8.877 billion in bonds for water-related infrastructures, uh, such as conservancy projects, water conveyance, and supply, stream restoration, et cetera, and other environmental projects. It's a pretty complicated uh, bond initiative uh, and includes uh, such things as um, flood uh, control for Oroville Dam and things in the Delta area. It's uh, pretty comprehensive. It's, it covers uh, different conservancies. Um, uh, Eastern Sierra uh, is part of it as uh, the Bay Area is um, Southern California a lot of different agencies that are already existing would uh, receive monies from this for various projects. In 2014, um, Proposition 1 authorized $7.12 billion in bonds for water infrastructure at that time, also for watershed protection. Uh, this proposition is modeled on Prop 1 with a more concentrated emphasis on groundwater restoration, wastewater recycling, uh, there's also uh, some things written in for different areas about desalinization, water for fish and wildlife also. As of fiscal year 2017 to 2018, the legislature has appropriated 86% of Prop 1 money, so we have not spent everything for that proposition yet. The purpose of Proposition 3 is to raise the total of $8.877 billion for the different infrastructures related to water storage, water sales, water conveyance, water use in different areas as that pertains to agricultural areas or more rural areas where it might be for habitat uh, preservation and control and for recreation. 
among the um, amounts in the uh, proposition are 3.3 billion for safe drinking water and water quality, 2.895 billion for watershed and fisheries improvements, 940 million for habitat protection around the state in different areas, 865 million for groundwater sustainability and or storage projects, 855 million also for improved water conveyance. That means how water is delivered to its end users. And I learned from NID's um, uh, information that 92% of water in California is actually used by agricultural end users. So this proposition would uh, place um, these dollar amounts into the taxpayer's responsibility rather than end user's responsibility. Also in the proposition, 1.398 billion is to be spent on disadvantaged communities and additional 2.637 billion to be prioritized for disadvantaged communities and that is defined by the state in the proposition. The economic and fiscal effects of the proposition, the state costs of 17.3 billion to pay off the principal which is 8.9 billion and the interest on that over on the bonds for a 40 year period and the annual payments on those bonds on the bond itself excuse me would average 433 million the pros and cons on this proposition the pros would mean safer drinking water would help assist in long term drought relief and preparedness it would improve water quality in groundwater, rivers, lakes, and streams, and other types of habitats that include groundwater. Repa it would repair existing canals, the uh, Delta Canal, the, the current Friant Canal is one of those, and Oroville and other dams. It would re help restore forests and wetlands, help improve fisheries and aquatic habitats throughout the state, and would encourage and provide uh, funding for it using purified recycled water for industry and landscaping. And as I mentioned earlier, there's also uh, desalinization aspects to this. And the money would be awarded um, in grants and different fundraising um, through the grant process. The cons on this is it does not provide new money for water storage as in dams and the state is not currently using the bond funds in existence from Proposition 1 to help maintain existing dams. And that's uh, something that the uh, proposition um, wording does address because the dams is, like Oroville Dam are federal projects but um, the federal government is not always um, current on maintaining uh, and, and keeping those dams in uh, working order. So this would come in to assist with that. Uh, there is no explanation other than the defined communities uh, on who the disadvantaged communities would be. And there have been eight bond measures since 1996 and not one has created um, uh, more water storage or the availability for more water. Uh, the payback and the loan and interest would put the burden on the taxpayers and it does not address any clamping down or uh, provisions for water wastage. Supporters include uh, Californians for a safe drinking water and clean and reliable water supply. That was a committee formed to, to assist this. Uh, Representative Jim Costa, Democrat District 16. Uh, John Garamendi, U.S. Representative. Former Treasurer Phil Angelides. Uh, also includes uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein and another senator uh, and a couple of candidates, John Cox, who's the Republican candidate for governor, and Fiona Ma, who's running for treasurer. Uh, it also includes the California Labor Federation and the professional engineers in California government. Opposed to it is Janet Roberts, who is the president, Robert Jarvis, vice president, and Murray Bass, a member of the Central Solano Citizens Taxpayers Group. And this is the citizens group that um, helped create this bond issue. Uh, it also includes uh, in opposition the Sierra Club of California, Save the American Rivers Association, and the Friends of the River, and the Southern California Watershed Alliance. Cash raised in support of Prop 3 is uh, $3,043,199.91. Uh, top donors are Ducks Unlimited at 400000 the California Waterfowl Association, 275,000. Western Growers, 275,000. 
California Wildlife Festa Fund at 200,000 and the American Pistachio Growers at $160,180. To this date, there has been uh, no cash raised in opposition of it. And again, as in any other bond, um, a no vote means that it will not be passed and a yes vote means that that money would be allocated. Can, start, would you hold on for one minute? Sure. Did I miss something there? You said that in opposition to it was somebody who put the bond me measure on? As uh, it, it was a committee that helped write the proposition and it's the Central Solano Citizens Taxpayers Group. So why are they in opposition to it? Oh, I'm sorry, they were not in opposition. Uh, they were not part of the writing of it. I misspoke, so thank you for correcting me on that. Yeah, they are in opposition. They have written the opposition, okay. uh, the opposition okay. statement. Yeah, all right. Thanks they wrote it, but I, I misspoke as to which, which one they wrote. Okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks. Okay, um, next for Proposition 4, we have Jeff Pettit. Jeff is part of our Sheriff's Department and a League of Women Voters member. Good evening. Tonight I'll be going over Proposition 4, which is also known as the Children's Hospital Bond Initiative. Uh, this proposition would authorize the sales of $1.5 billion in general obligation bonds. The money would, would be used to fund grants for construction of children's hospitals or the expansion and renovation of existing children's hospitals. This proposition is a state statute initiative that was initiated by a citizen signature collection. The intent of this proposition is, just, is to improve the specialized care of children throughout the state. The funds would be dispersed with 72% going to eight of the nonprofit hospitals serving high volumes of children with serious disease, 18% to five University of California general acute hospitals, and then another 10% to private hospitals um, to provide that pre provide pediatric services. The fiscal impact, the fiscal impact would cost the state $2.9 billion uh, to pay off the principal of $1.5 billion and an interest of uh, what's estimated to be at $1.4 billion. Again, this is coming out of, as Stephen mentioned, the general fund of, from the state of California. Annual payments are estimated to be approximately $84 million over the next uh, 35 years. Pros and cons, uh, those who are for the proposition say that the funds are needed to keep up with the growing demand for specialized pediatric care. Um, they have had two similar bonds that were passed, one in 2004 for approximately $750 million and one in 2008 for $980 million. All of that 204 uh, bond measure has been um, utilized and approximately 90% of the 2008 has been spent. So this uh, proposition would continue the funding for many of those uh, hospitals that specialize in children's care. Most of those hospitals receive their funding from Medi-Cal. Uh, they also receive some um, payments from insurance companies, California Children's Services. Um, however, those do not cover the full costs um, of those hospitals. So these um, propositions and these bond measures have been uh, brought forward to, to bridge that gap in the funding of those hospitals. Um, those who are against this measure, uh, measure, excuse me, argue that we should first look at improving the healthcare system first. And again, um, it would need to be repaid and it adds to that debt that we um, already have on the um, state general fund. So spending, spending in favor of Proposition 4. Um, this bond was supported by Yes on Children's Hospitals, or Yes on Children's Hospitals, sponsored by the California Children's Hospitals Association. Um, it should be noted that the, um, the eight uh, primary nonprofit hospitals were the major donors in that. Um, and as of September 22nd, they have raised, um, as you see, $10,904,300. As of September 22nd, 2018, there have been no funds uh, reportedly raised in opposition of this proposition. So what does that mean? Uh, yes vote means you would authorize the state to sell an additional 1.5 billion in general obligation bonds um, for this proposition and to bridge the gap for the uh, children's hospitals. And a no vote would not, author would not authorize the sale of the same bonds. 
And as luck has it, I also have Proposition 5, which originally I thought was a great idea to take this proposition until I really started digging into it. Um, so Proposition 5, this is a uh, property, it's called the Property Tax Transfer Initiative. Um, what this does is it basically would amend um, Proposition, not basically, it would amend Proposition 13 um, to allow qualifying homeowners to transfer the tax assessed value from their prior home to their new home. So a lot of us may recall um, that in 1978 we passed, Pro we passed Proposition 13 which locked in our um, property tax or assessed property tax value um, to a 1975 uh, level of what it was what our homes were at in 1975 and then it would allow for growth of no more of no more than two percent but it was supposed to go at the um, that would reflect inflation in the state um, what this does, this proposition is a combined constitutional amendment, so it would actually have to amend the state constitution and a state statute that was initiated by citizen signature collection. It would allow home buyers who are 55 or older or severely disabled to transfer their current home's tax assessed value to their new home anywhere in the state of California. Uh, currently, you people that are 55 or older or that have that are severely disabled can make that transfer one time within a county. Um, if they want to move from one county to another and have that same cost or, or tax savings, the, two, the, the county that you're moving to would have to have previously agreed to that. I think there, and I could be wrong, it, um, it was approximately 11 of the counties in the state of California had already had, were the only ones participating in that program. Um, it would also allow for an adjusted value between the old and new value, between the old and new value. There's a math equation that I would suggest that if you want to really delve into that, I can explain it afterwards. It's, it's quite comp complicated and convoluted how they do that adjustment, um, but they can either adjust that a little bit up or a little bit down, but you would still come away with a, a, a lower tax, you'd have with tax savings. Okay, this proposition would result in an annual property tax losses for local governments, special districts, and schools. Um, it would result in an annual property tax loss for the local governments and special districts of approximately 150 million in the near term and growing over, and growing over time uh, to 1 billion or more a year. The annual losses for the schools would be approximately 150 million per year initially and would go up to approximately, again, one billion or more. Apologize for the missing one. Um, additionally, there would be an increase in state costs because the state would need to cover the, the loss to the, the school districts. So there would be an increased state cost to the schools in those equivalent amounts. So starting again at 150 and going up to one billion or more a year. So those who are for the proposition say that California is facing a major housing shortage and this proposition would allow seniors to move out of their homes that are too big or too small and move closer to children without the big property tax increases. And those that are against the measure argue that this proposition doesn't add housing and it would make it harder for cities and counties to pay for schools and public safety. Uh, this bond is supported by homeownership for families and tax savings for seniors, sponsor, sponsored by the California Association of Realtors and the Asso California Associ Association of Realtors, sorry, and the National Association of uh, Realtors are the two biggest contributors uh, to this fund. And according to Boutpedia, they have raised $13,204,000, I'm sorry, $13,204,875.08. They really got it down to the dollar descent. And this bond is opposed by no on Proposition 5, uh, sponsored by educators, public safety, and health organizations. Um, the major contributors to that are the Service Employees International Union, SEIU, who've donated approximately a million dollars, as well as the California Teachers Association, who've donated approximately $500,000. And uh, to date, they have raised $1,758,411.81. So what is a yes vote? A yes, a yes vote supports amending the California Constitution, Constitution to allow home buyers who are age 55 or older to, or severely disabled to transfer their tax assessments with a possible adjustment from their prior home to their new home, no matter A, the new 
the new home's market value, B, the new home's location in the state, or C, the buyer's number of moves. So they can do this multiple times. Uh, a no vote means you voters would oppose changing how tax assessments are transferred between properties for home buyers who are age 55 or older of, or severely disabled. That's it. Thank you, Jeff. Next, for Proposition 6, we're going to ask Doug Bianchi. Doug is our Voter Services Chair right now, and he has been the uh, main person behind putting on all of these forums. Um, so I want to really thank Doug uh, for doing all the work. Yay, Doug. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's been a uh, privilege to do this. Um, my notes out here. I'm going to be pretty brief about this because um, we're going to have a couple of... Uh, uh, young people from the debate team at NU up here to give you the pros and cons in maybe a little bit more spirited fashion than I will. So I'm just going to briefly cover the elements of Proposition 6. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and the uh, proposition, um, last year the legislature uh, passed some gasoline and diesel taxes and this proposition would eliminate those taxes. Um, uh, it repeals 2017's fuel tax and vehicle fee increases and requires public vote on future increases and eliminates some road repair and transportation funding. So uh, again, in 2017, the legislature passed legislation increasing taxes on gasoline, uh, 12 cents a gallon, and diesel fuel at 20 cents a gallon and increasing vehicle fees to fund road repair and other transportation needs. And the purpose of the legislature's imposition of the fuel taxes and fees, the purpose of Proposition 6, excuse me, is to reverse the legislature's imposition of fuel taxes and fees and to amend the Constitution to require voter approval for any future transportation-related taxes and fees. Um, Drivers will pay less for fuel and fees. That's one of the effects. And less money will be available for road repairs and other transportation needs. That's another one of the effects. Pros and cons, it's pretty simple. Gas taxes and fees are too high, according to the people that make the argument in favor. And the money should stay in the pockets of drivers. The voters should make these decisions about taxation and uh, fuel fees. Um, the arguments against? California's roads and bridges need repair, and requiring voter approval of fuel taxes and vehicle risks, risk, vehicle fees risks ballot box budgeting and reduces flex, flexibility. And ballot box budgeting um, often has unintended effects. So uh, if there are uh, requirements and needs in the future uh, for road repair, um, Proposition, um, the, the, excuse me, the, the uh, measure passed by the legislature last year provides for a steady stream of income for these things. Um, if uh, if this is denied, if this if Proposition six, six passes, um, there will be there will be a requirement for um, people to vote on the tax increases, and um, sometimes that gets uh, a little um, awkward, a little bit difficult and, and more convoluted, and sometimes uh, those things wind up being paid by bond, bond measures. Um, so the support for the California, uh, for Proposition 6 is the California Republican Party, uh, John Cox, candidate for governor, Republican, Doug LaMalfa, Republican District 1 representative, and the National Federation of Independent Businesses. And the opposition? is uh, the opposition to uh, is a California Democratic Party, California Jerry Brown, and the California Chamber of Commerce. And there are a number of others. I've abbreviated these. There's a long list. Uh, I, I, I found that, that my, the resource of Ballotpedia um, is the most straightforward and easy to understand. It's very navigable if you go on the site. So here's the spending, sort of often tells the tale, a total of approximately 300 and 3646000 and the top donors, as you can see, California Republican Party, Kevin McCarthy for Congress, John Cox, the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association, California Republican Party, which I, I wrote that down twice. 
John Cox. Oh, this is a repetition, I'm sorry. So next slide. The top donors uh, in opposition are the State Building and Construction Trades Council and the Southern California District Council of Laborers, the International Union of Operating Engineers and the Southern California Partnership for Jobs. So um, with that, I would like to introduce um, Lyndon Lovett and Hagen Noyes, who uh, are going to take over from me and present, we hope, a nice spirited and civil debate, debate on Proposition 6. Hi, I'm Lyndon Lovett and this is Hagen. Um, and just like a quick disclaimer, the two arguments that we are both um, representing are not our personal views. We're just, just debating. So, yeah. Lyndon, I want to make sure that you're really speaking right into that. Right into um, this? Okay, yeah, thank get, you. Get it, get it in there. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Okay. I am going to be debating the pros for a yes vote for Proposition 6. Okay, I'm going to pre briefly state again what he already went over, but um, uh, Proposition 6 proposes to repeal the 2017 tax initiative and ensure voter approval for all future gas and vehicle taxes. This initiative repeals the increased gas and vehicle taxes enacted in 2017 and requires voter approval for all future ones. A yes vote is imperative in supporting our working class, creating more equal transportation opportunities and improving economy. Californians currently pay the highest gas prices in the nation while we have a large working class. Working families can barely keep up with the already high cost of living in California. This unnecessary cost just adds to that charge. The increased gas and car taxes could cost a family more than $500 per year, which can be very noticeable. Taxes that tax the poor and wealthy equally often disproportionately affect the poor, for whom it might be the difference between putting food on the table and getting to work. Repealing it would save families hundreds and heartache, not to mention foster opportunities for future growth. Current legislature actually prohibits the increased tax revenue from being spent on increasing space on high tra highly trafficked freeways, ensuring taxpayers will continue to sit in traffic while their money does no nothing to speed up their travel times. The money is not going to what we actually need. It's going to unnecessary infrastructure. The taxes generated by this measure are going to things like bike lanes instead of increasing lanes for highly trafficked freeways. The, we have an already large, or California has an already large transportation budget. Um, California currently has $15.7 in infrastructural reserves, um, and all infrastructural funds come from, obviously, the general fund. A 2017 fact check um, said that our general fund has grown by $36 billion in the last year, and none of it has gone directly to infrastructure. We want to see, we should want to see a more direct impact. Right now, what we need is more lanes and better designed routes, not more bike lanes and more side walks. Um, lastly, uh, gas is a fundamental necessity to our society. It is not a luxury that we can be asked to give up especially as our state has such an active agricultural economy in which um, efficient public transportation is not readily available. Making private transportation difficult and unattainable to our vital working class has direct negative impacts on our communities and economy. Yeah, so um, voting yes on Prop 6 will directly grow and strengthen our economy by lessening the fiscal stress on transportation expenses, and it will give us a more direct vote in our future tax measures. Right. So what exactly is going to happen with the current uh, $5 billion that are being allocated towards um, transportation from this tax annual? Um, well, we have the fourth highest tax rate in the nation and the fourth highest tax reserve. Um, we have 
not had, I believe, um, major infrastructural issues for the in the past many, many years. Um, and this, ta this tax was a recent measure um, in 2017. So we have managed up until 2017 and we can continue to manage without that additional five billion. Okay. What is the necessary benefit of having the voters directly um, vote on things like future gas taxes? Um, well, I think the argument there um, is that it's, it's one, it's undemocratic, uh, not to really, for, because it's something that is so directly impactful on our everyday budgets and our everyday lives, uh, obviously gas and owning a vehicle, um, that it should be something that we have the right to have a voice in. All right. Um, so. Right now, our infrastructure in California and kind of in the United States in general is fairly shoddy. We have potholes everywhere. There's risks of bridges collapsing. There's just an, a general lack of funding and care to our infrastructure. Our public transportation is some of the worst for the kind of current state of country we are in with uh, developmental things. Um, a few things, um, like in Minneapolis, the I-35 incident, where a bridge collapsed, uh, with 500 cars on it because they didn't have the correct funds and didn't allocate the correct, like the right amount of money to that bridge. There's a few things that we want to focus on here when we're talking about voting yes on um, Prop 6. The first is that our infrastructure. Yes, California has a very high infrastructure bill, but we can clearly see examples of, and reasons why that is currently not enough. Um, things like lack of bus transportation or trains or various other things are just not as apparent as they should be. Talking about uh, interacting with like the lower class, buses and a lot of money from this. Um, there's several hundred projects that involved, uh, uh, it was like about 500 projects were involved with public transportation and increasing the availability and functionality of that that were acquired from this bill. There were roughly 7,000 projects in general that were uh, affected by this bill and created and allowed, um, were allowed to, be ha to happen because of this gas tax. Another thing we want to focus on here is the voter and the people are for this bill, um, shown um, by Prop 69 in Sacramento and various other initiatives um, across the state showing that we want our public transportation funds to be allocated towards the correct things, uh, making so politicians aren't using that money to just pocket it and putting it in various other projects, not allocating it towards the proper um, measures. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about is this bill incentivizes things like uses of uh, HOV lanes and carpooling and electric cars, allowing just the general footprint that we currently have on our entire ecosystem and just in general a better and more healthy interaction. So voting yes on Prop 6 takes that $5 billion away, kills that 7,000, those 7,000 road projects that happen each year because of it, and don't allow people to get like fundamental things that like road safety, we, it's just better for everyone. The firefighters of California do not want this to go through. Um, various state organizations and public service organizations are um, against this um, in their unions. So it's just, a, we, this is a necessary bill that we should have and it's a, okay. Okay, um, you did not direct, uh, directly address the voter input um, component of this bill. Um, how can you guarantee that taxes won't continue to rise in the future? Well, so a few things here. Um, first is that taxes are inevitable. We all know that. Um, they continue to go up. They kind of always will go up. It's the way the world is kind of working. We'd say that this minimal, like, yes, it can create a large difference in the fiscal year, but this minimal input that everyone has allows us to gain a ton of leverage and a ton of money to go to things like public transportation. Um, also, as of now, energy efficient vehicles uh, sadly are very expensive. Um, so how can that, how does that argument really um, balance the effect that this bill has on 
the working class. Yeah. And so just in general, it creates a small incentivization on choosing those vehicles. And it's not just those specific vehicles. It's the HOV lane and having the, like, desirability to have multiple people in your car, less gas, better for everyone. Okay, so my opponent doesn't con continue to not directly address the um, the effect that this bill will have on the working class and how imperative it is really to recognize that. Um, he merely states the environmental stress that this bill will kind of alleviate um, and also how our infrastructure is collapsing, which is a interesting argument because I don't feel that we really have a problem with infrastructure collapsing in California. Um, he also um, says how s kind of small the amount of money it is that we are uh, that we are taxing, which is true. Um, the the gas tax is very small on paper, like twelve cents. Um, but gradually, as you are pro can probably guess, that adds up um, really quickly and can be many hundreds of dollars over years, which makes a really big difference. Um, and we, yeah, we have, we currently have a very, very large budget already. And so there's really no reason to increase that $5 billion, especially when it's at such a great individual cost. All right. So yes, it is a fair, it can add up to large amounts, but the key thing here that is very detrimental to the working class is public transportation. The U.S. and uh, California and the U.S. in general have a very large lacking of public transportation that is known throughout most of the world is ahead of us on it. These, this bill has, allocate, has created more than 500 different transportation uh, networks and uh, created different projects like creating different bus routes, allowing more efficient buses, allowing bus tickets to be cheaper stuff like that, which all equates and affects the working class, allows them to get to work better, allows them to physically get to work if they aren't able to get to work in the first place, and just in general makes life better for them. Having safer roads, safer bridges, safer everything is just kind of a good idea for all of us. We don't want to have potholes and messed up roads that are degrading, creating environmental hazards and creating things like crashes, makes accidents more prone. It's just simply not a good thing. We want to have that $5 billion is a lot. Thank, Thank you, you. too. Yeah. Great. Okay, we're going to ask um, Stephen Munkel to come back up and do uh, Proposition 7. While he's doing that, I just want to um, say that, that the, debate, the debate team um, members Normally, they do policy debate, which means that they do something called spreading, and they talk really, 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 really fast when they do their debates. So these guys have really had to slow it down um, so that it makes it understandable to all of us. You did a good job. Thank you. So Proposition 7 is the third uh, legislative statute on the ballot. It's not a bond measure, so we know the legislature is recommending this, and because there's no identifiable fiscal impact, uh, there's not any co uh, committees in, in support or opposition, so there's no money being spent on this. So it's kind of an uh, interesting exercise in what you think about daylight savings time and daylight and night and all that sort of stuff. Um, the goal of the proposition is to conform daylight savings to federal law and also to affirm the present system for daylight savings time, but it allows uh, for future legislative amendments by a two-third vote of the legislature to the way that California handles daylight savings, including creating a possibility for the legislature to make daylight saving time a year-round function rather than a nine-month function um, if Congress and the President approve that as a federal system. Uh, the status quo is that we have part-year daylight savings time. It started in 1949 or shortly after the end of World War II um, as an initiative measure, and that's why currently it has to be amended by an initiative. Uh, federal law currently requires that daylight saving time start uh, in March and end uh, in November, but Arizona and Hawaii are always on standard time. They never go to daylight savings time, and that's 
an exception that's allowed by federal law. <clears throat> if uh, any states want to switch to year-round daylight savings time, then Congress and the President have to approve that as a national measure. Um, this legislative statute proposed by Assembly Bill 807, uh, if passed, the measure allows changes to daylight saving time by the legislature rather than by initiative. So that would take it out of that situation where you have the ballot box problem of, of having to take it back to the voters for every single change. Uh, but it would require a supermajority of the legislature, two-thirds to pass. It encourages consideration, it, it encourages the consideration of year-round daylight savings time, but it doesn't actually implement that because that would require a change of federal law. The goal is to position California to take advantage of a national daylight saving program if that it becomes a law uh, at the federal level. There's no anticipated direct fiscal effects if this passes. Um, there is some evidence that changing the clocks twice a year affects worker productivity and certain health issues, and the net effects are likely minor. Pros, uh, those in favor who are people in the legislature, uh, think that changing the clocks uh, causes increased energy use and an increase in some health problems. There are people have stress-related problems when they have to make adjustments to the clocks, including uh, increase in heart attacks that happens around that time every year. 68% um, of the countries in the world do not do any change of time, and the trend is away from making changes. And then, of course, if you're, if you're going to a system without change, where you keep the same clock all year, it would be, the current question would be, do you stay with the standard time, or do you just stay with daylight savings time? The con, opponents basically say, hey, Back in 1974, when we had an energy crisis, we went to year-round daylight saving time, and everybody hated it being dark in the morning. Um, it's a legislative statute. Um, in support uh, are two members of the Assembly, Karen Chu and Lorena Gonzalez, and there's no finance committee. And in opposition, Assemblyman Philip Chen and Senator Hannah Beth Jackson and no finance committee. A yes vote means that the legislature could authorize year-around daylight savings time in the future by a two-thirds vote. The change would first have to be approved by Congress and the President. A no vote means we keep the current system of daylight savings time, which is based on the federal statute, uh, from March to November, and then we have standard time in the winter. Voter, voter approval would be required for any change in the future if you have a no vote. That's it. Thank you, Stephen. Next, we're going to ask Sharon O'Hara to come up. Lots of you know Sharon. She's been a longtime League of Women Voter member and an activist around town. And Sharon is going to do number eight. They left me eight bottles of water here. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of that, um, I took this um, initiative to present to you because my late husband was part um, of the group of people who have used dialysis centers. He had kidney failure uh, before he died, and I spent a lot of time at the DeVita uh, Center here in Grass Valley. Um, I also wanted to thank Holly because she's going to just change the, um, the slides from time to time. I'm not going to read them to you, but you could. Yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm also a little bit personally conflicted about this because I'm a real advocate for unions. I'm a retired member of the California Teachers Association, and this turns out to be a major uh, battle, so to speak, between uh, the union, SEIU, uh, UHW West, and the two major dialysis providers, uh, Davida and I think it's pronounced Fres Fresenius, uh, medical care. So as much as uh, you probably have seen a great number of ads already about the deplorable conditions in some dialysis centers. As a person who watched my husband go through it, I think that one up here is exceptional, but I'm not supposed to take positions on things, but just mentioning that. Um, <clears throat> however, Proposition 8 establishes a new front in the conflict between SEIU, UHW West, the labor organization, and the state's two largest dialysis businesses. The union has said that workers at the clinics have been attempting to unionize since 2016, 
but the employers were retaliating against pro-union employees. Brian Wong, a member of the opposition campaign to the initiative, that would be the businesses, argues that the sole reason that UHW is pushing this member is measure is to organize workers in the dialysis clinics. And those of you that know what most unions stand for would not be surprised to hear that. Worley, a spokesperson for the union, contended that the dialysis workers want these initiative reforms regardless of what happens to their union efforts. That's where you have to make your decisions about what you believe is happening. And then the uh, representative of the union added, the goal of this ballot initiative is to hold the dialysis industry accountable and to improve life for patients and for the people who care for them every day. There are two columnists, one from the SACB and one from LA Times, Jim Miller and Melanie Mason, who have both written columns in which they stated that the ballot initiative could also provide the SEIU UHW West with leverage over the legislation to enact new reg regulations on dialysis clinics in the state legislature. The union is taking a two-pronged approach, they say, wanting to make sure that we have as many options as possible. In 2017, though, legislation was introduced in our state legislature, but it wasn't passed to require staff-patient ratios in dialysis clinics and, like the current ballot initiative, to limit the revenue of those businesses. So uh, <clears throat> in front of you, then, is the, um, the overview and at the end, you can certainly write questions on cards, and I'll probably refer to you to the same places that I got this information, which is our wonderful information from the League, as well as Ballotpedia, Ballotpedia and the Secretary of State. When you see the ads, you realize that um, the union is pointing out some really terrible things in their estimation that are happening at the clinics. And the dialysis business is of course concerned about their business and the effect of having unions uh, organizing them. Next. And so you won't be surprised to see the difference in the dollars that have been um, contributed in, in uh, opposition and in uh, support of this. So what you're going to do if you vote yes is take a look at the limits that dialysis clinics can charge um, probably we're all, most of us in this room are lucky enough to have insurance on our own or, you know, Medicare and supplements. And so we don't really necessarily see what's being paid um, to our insurances by the clinics. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> to the clinics. But uh, there are some discrepancies and some clinics uh, do tend to not want to take uh, various patients who are not fully insured. And so that could be a little bit of a, a limit that um, might happen if the um, dialysis clinics get to maintain their status quo. So there we are. So you'll have to do your some reading, and I'll be glad to talk to you afterwards. Okay, now I'm going to introduce myself. <laughs> My name is Janice Bidane. Um I have taken Proposition 10. Okay. So is everything is on here that I have on my thing? Wow, all right then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Proposition 10, it expands local government's authority to enact rent control on residential property. This is one of those controversial ones that will have the um, kids um, go back. That was too fast. That we'll have the kids um, debate. So the question is, should the current state law that limits the scope of city and county rent control ordinances be repealed, allowing cities and counties more authority to limit rental rates that residential property owners may charge for new tenants, new construction, and single family homes? Okay. So 30 years ago, some cities in California adopted various rent control ordinances. And then what happened is that in 1995, the state legislature adopted what's known as the Costa-Hawkins Rental Housing Act. And what this did was it 
put restrictions on the ordinances so that houses that were built after 1995 or turned into rentals after 1995, they could not be controlled, nor could single family homes be controlled. So there was rent control, but you just couldn't apply it to anything that became a rental from 1995 on. Okay. Renters in California right now, we pay about 50% more than the national average for housing. There are cities who would like to establish rent control ordinances to meet their housing challenges. This is an initiative statute. Um, I think I've said all that already, so you can go ahead. Okay, so we don't really know the fiscal impact on this because um, it, 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 we don't know what the ordinances would be basically, that towns and, and cities and counties might enact. So we actually don't know um, how it's going to affect the tax base, but it's, it's likely that's what's going to happen is that it's going to re um, reduce revenues for our local governments. So the pro on this is that, of course, you know, as with many of these other housing um, propositions that have come forward protects people on lower in, or fixed income, and it allows um, it, it allows more local control of housing issues. I think that's one of the things that's sort of really important to understand about this is that um, the pro people are saying local communities really need to be able to take charge of their particular housing issues. So it's not the 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 or the proposition does not say thou shall have rent control. Uh, it's saying, if you want rent control, you can do it. Okay, so the con on this is that um, rent control laws reduce rental housing as landlords will be less likely to rent existing properties or to build new rentals. So landlords in situations like this where they are being regulated are very often want to uh, take their rental off of the um, rental market. Um, and on top of that, the con is that it will establish new bureaucracies that will, will um, you know, mandate certain things to people. So you got more government on you. Support for Prop 10. Um, the, the, the names are less important than their positions. Um, Co-president of the California Nurses Association, president of the California Alliance for Retired Americans, and executive director of the Eviction uh, Defense Network. So clearly people who are aligned with, um, you know, uh, people who are typically the renters, lower income, and um, uh, those employed in the service industry. Opposition to Prop 10. Uh, these are the official... Um, Arguments in the Voter's Guide, President of the California State Conference of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, State Commander of the American GI Forum of California, and President of the California Association of Realtors. A little over $14 million has been raised in support of the proposition. AIDS Healthcare Foundation, California Teachers Association, California Nurses Association, Committee to Save Our Neighborhoods, Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment Action. Spending is over 45 million from the Association of Realtors, Equity Residential, Michael Haid, I don't know, Western National Group and Affiliated Entities, I'm not exactly sure what that is, Blackstone Property Partners, obviously in the rentals, um, Real Estate Partners and their holdings, Essex Property Trust Inc., Inc. and affiliated entities. So lots of people who are involved with um, real estate. So what does this vote, uh, what does this mean for your vote? A yes vote on Proposition 10 supports allowing local governments to adopt rent control and repealing the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act. So, so a yes vote means that those houses that are now protected from 1995 on would no longer be protected if local officials felt it was prudent to apply rent control within their municipalities. A no vote on Proposition 10 opposes the initiative and it keeps the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act um, continuing to prohibit local governments from enacting rent control on those buildings. So now 
Will you guys introduce yourselves? We'll hear a, another quick debate from our policy debate team. Hi, um, my name's Evelyn Granfield and this is Brendan Olmos. We're here to debate the pro and con side of Proposition 10. I'm gonna be debating for it and he's gonna be debating against it. And I'm just gonna give the same disclaimer that Lyndon did. This aren't, these aren't necessarily our personal beliefs. We're here for like the education of voters and not to preach our political values. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm just going to start by going over basically what she just covered. Proposition 10 has received a lot of bad press, but I intend to show you what the proposition is really about and why it's a good idea for both Nevada City and the rest of California. Um, a lot of the debate for Proposition 10 is centered around rent control, good, bad, but and just to clarify what rent control is, it gives cities the ability to regulate the amount charged for housing and how much landlords can increase it by. It's currently in place in a few major cities, like in California, like San Francisco and Los Angeles, and it allows these cities to stop rent prices from continuing to, st to skyrocket. The issue here is that Proposition 10 isn't actually mandating rent control directly. What it does is overturn the Close to Hawkins Act, which placed restrictions on rent control for cities in California. So Close to Hawkins is a California piece of legislation passed in 1995 that did three things. It said that there can be no rent control on new buildings, uh, single family houses, condominiums, and other properties. And that when a renter moves out of a rent control department, landlords are allowed to raise the price to whatever amount they see fit. And then the apartment would again be subject to no raises in rent over the amount specified by rent control. So repealing this Coast Hawkins Act would benefit Nevada County and the rest of California for three main reasons. The first is that it gives cities more control, like she said local control, it allows cities to decide what's best for them. Rent prices aren't standardized over all of California. Market prices can often be corrupt and unfair, um, and it makes it hard for low-income people and people on fixed incomes to get affordable housing. So giving cities control over what prices they think is best for them and what would benefit them most is good to fix all of these problems. And the second reason is that rent control, uh, rent prices are just out of control in California. They just are. It's really hard to find a good house, especially in cities like San Francisco. And even though it has rent control, the reason why it's so hard is because of the Costa Hawkins Act. Rent control is the only effective method of controlling these high prices. Without it, landlords can raise prices for current tenants at any time, and low-income citizens have an extremely hard time trying to find affordable housing. Um, Costa Hawkins effectively takes away all of the benefits to rent control. Because rent control cannot be enforced in new properties, these properties have extremely high rates. And the old ones, who still have to follow rent control law, become overcrowded. It hurts landowners because they are unable to make a good living as compared to other areas in the city. And it hurts tenants because either their prices are too high or their apartments are extremely crowded. Uh, the third reason is that the current system of rent control gives landlords a reason to evict long-term tenants. Costa Hawking says that they can re raise the rate to whatever they want once an apartment is vacated even though when someone moves back in, their rent can only be raised by a certain percentage every year. This makes landlords want to evict tenants so that they can make more money. Without passing Proposition 10, it will be hard to pe for people to keep a long-term apartment without paying extra money somewhere else off the books. So the basis of my argument here is that Proposition 10 isn't forcing anyone to do anything. It's just a good common sense policy. The city can decide whether or not to implement rent control on each of the three areas, but Proposition 10 isn't actually forcing them to do anything. It's up to each individual city. 
In order for rent control to function the way it's meant to, we have to give cities more control. Only then can rent control have the intended effect of lowering housing prices and making a place to live accessible for both people with less money and people with fixed income. Questions? Um, so how do you stop these um, rental boards from putting unreasonable prices on the landlords? Um, rent control boards really have no reason to do this. For example, in San Francisco, you can literally go to their rent control board website and apply for a job there. Rent control boards are made up of citizens, the people renting and owning the apartments. Their goals would be to make rent, con rent prices the most reasonable possible. Does this halt, um, how does this incentivize landlords to with cities that have implemented rent control, how does it incentivize landlords to develop more, t more buildings and rent units? Oh, sure. So um, rent control prices would make everything more standardized. So instead of competing with other properties by lowering prices, rent landowners would have to compete by improving their buildings to make them more appealing to consumers. So it would incentivize them to do it in that way, I guess. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Any more? No. Okay, cool. California is in a, crisis, in a house crisis. That's no denying that. But what my opponent is advocating for is it will not only not work, but it will make it worse. It, it plunges the already limited housing construction and development of new homes, stagnating the market. But also constrained landlords as brand new government bureaucracy looms over them and, ma and making them only pick low risk income tenants, gentrifying and private communities out of the area. I have three reasonable, reasonable reasons why propositions should not be passed. One, allowing local bureaucracy to have total access of already precarious landlords is detrimental. Two, de decentivizing landlords and investors to develop new housing and pushes them to look for alternative sources of revenue. Three, it makes landlords more picky about new tenants, driving risk-based tenants into the slums. If prop number one argument. If Proposition 10 passed, more than 539 rental boards would be in charge of giving governmental agencies unlimited power to put fees on housing costing, costing and rent. It it would also cause massive legal fees as if ten tenants feel disgruntled by this, they can bring this to court and it would slow down the process of new tenants entering, entering the housing market. Which would inevitably make it harder for tenants to enter the market. Next, the largest issue allowing rent control that it, that it incentivizes landlords instead of pay the rate they, they demolish buildings, or they reduce the amount of tenants they are allowed as they can, as tenants move, brand new ones, either way, it forces existing tenants to move back into the market that allows it smaller. So what I'm basically saying is that the low income tenant, that since it's a pr fixed price, their high income tenants will no longer be sufficient enough funds for them to afford afford to develop new buildings, so they would have to demolish ones that aren't making enough profit, kicking the, uh, kicking the impoverished people out of the, out of the buildings. Well, and another reason is gentrification. Well, since landowners see no, since landowners have a fixed price and their high income tenants, no longer fixed price, they have no reason to ha fix their land, their buildings, make it upkeep, harder for them to enter make it hard for upkeep to enter, which makes them choosy on who they let. Only low risk and stable income people would be allowed into, which would make it, economic, make it harder for people of color and impoverished people, barring them from becoming economically stable again. Which should, um, some of what I'm saying is, well, <laughs> what I'm saying is saying is, Fixing prices will only anger the landlords, which they will instead will make them feel more conservative about who they let in, and it will also make it harder for them to upkeep landlords, which will make them choosier to enter new tenants, and it will just it will bar people if they see are high risk, 
or who have past criminal. F Hello? I don't know. <laughs> then Sorry. The already entering. Already entering the new market system, which will push. Can you guys share this other one, maybe? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> and the sum of it is that land, since this building does not put enough restrictions on landlord, landlords of how they choose their tenants, it would make it inevitably that they will only choose high income people to, for their fixed prices. Since they don't have the income or the revenue or the economical value to keep those buildings in low poverty areas. So to demolish them, putting more people into it must be something with my voice. <laughs> so in the sum of it, you, landlords, you can't fix land prices, but only make them fight back or leave the system altogether, leaving the crisis worse than it came off. That's what I'm done. <laughs> I'm so sorry about the mics. I don't know what's happening. Um, okay. So you talked a lot about the downsides of rent control but rent control continues to exist whether or not Proposition 10 is passed. So why specifically is overturning Costa Hawkins bad? So there was a study in Stanford that showed, which uh, Stanford is one of the cities, not, uh, Stanford did a study in San Francisco, which is a city that allows rent control. This study proved that, that the, that w when they put rent control on them, it would diminish the population and these the te and the landlords became more aggressive with their tenants, which made it harder for people to enter the enter communities of poor, enter communities. Okay. Um. So you said rent control boards can mandate unfair prices, but I'm just still unclear on understanding why they would do this. Can you give? A reason why? Well, again, well, the study, sh uh, there's a study that says when the 1995 one went in, that that landlords decreased their rent units by 15% all across the board, which which proved that the landlords have re saw that the pricing was unfair, which then made them less likely to enter new tenants and make the housing crisis worse as there's no physically units for people to enter in. Okay. Um, and can you just define gentrification, please, to clarify what that argument was? Oh, gentrification is where um, high rich communities either move into um, poor communities, kicking them out as they buy up all the property, or, or it, it stops poor people from entering, entering large, entering higher higher wealth higher wealth markets because it stops because the people bar them from entering as they see them too high risk for them to be living in the residential areas So I'd like to start by going over my main points from my first speech. Proposition 10 is just a good idea. It makes sense and it would benefit both tenants and landlords. It gives cities more control. It prevents landlords or it decreases the incentivization for landlords to evict long-term tenants and it would create more reasonable housing prices statewide. Um, so my partner said, or my opponent said that rent control makes landowners build condominiums instead of apartments. Um, but the reason that condos aren't subject to rent control is because of close to Hawkins. So if Proposition 10 passes, there would be no incentive for this to happen. Proposition 10, essentially solves this problem with rent control. It makes it more effective. Um, he also said that rent boards would become corrupt and rent control prices would be unfair, but 
I'd just like to say again, there's really no reason why this would happen. Rent control boards are made up of citizens and landowners. All of the reasons they would have for creating new rent control prices would be reasons to make them more reasonable and better for the community. Rent control boards aren't just government officials. You can literally apply to be on one. You would be given control over a part of the rent prices in your city. Um, yeah, and he also said that rent control would de-incentivize landowners to make improvements in their buildings. But I would like to cite a quote from Peter Dreyer, who is the Director of Urban and Environmental Policy at Occidental College. Um, and this is what he said to this same argument in a study done on Proposition 10. So under credible rent control laws, landlords are allowed a reasonable across the board rent increase every year. But to get it, they have to demonstrate that they are maintaining their properties. In fact, we found that rent control improves the quality of housing. So rent control kind of has the opposite effect that he was talking about. The last argument that my partner made was about gentrification. But with um, the rent prices being more standardized across the board, there would be no reason for richer people to move into poor communities. Um, the reasons, the driving forces for them to move into new buildings would be the upkeep and the maintenance, or how these buildings are maintained. Um, even if they moved into low income communities, these people who don't make as much money would still have access to other properties elsewhere. They're not kicking them out because the rent prices are still um, affordable for these people in other areas. Um, so just to summarize why Prop 10 is a good idea is that my partner mainly talked about just the downsides of rent control. But the reality is that where, whether or not Proposition 10 passes, rent control continues to exist. We should focus on making rent control better and more effective, and Proposition 10 is the way to do that. So my opponent co advocates that the rent control, that rent control and getting rid of safe, um, coastal hawkings allows for these cities to enter the cities to allow to pit these rent control zones. What I'm saying is these rent, these landlords, if it was such a big idea, why would they spend millions of dollars against it? Because they realize that it makes them lots of revenue. It builds them communities and makes them affordable to how they it is. And it also shows that this also shows big components of it, the Stanford project, or the Stanford study, show that these people can't afford houses when they when they put them on a standardized list. When they're standardized, they cut off the people of high high incomes at that's the thing, making it harder for landlords to accept in low income people. So we'll just keep it a round circle round circle of poor people and rich people having different sections of the city as they can no longer afford them and in integrating into the, the whole part. And when I'm, my opponent also talks about how, how like development will, will also increase, but how is that possible? When you stand, when you have the whole area on a fixed price, it would, tenants will not likely build up an increase. And it's proven when the 1995 bill was enacted, when Costa Rica was enacted, all these prices were fixed. Tenants, landlords, decreased their unit space. They did not allow anybody to enter, and they demolished buildings and de-incentivized them to help out the tenants. So we'll just make it a hostile environment for the whole community. And, and my, also, my opponent didn't also answer that how the legal system surrounding it would make it very hard for tenants to enter quickly and access this. So this bill might take a long time to enter because there'll be legal fees stop keeping tenants that have been evicted into this as they feel feel this new law feel that they have been disallowed by their new their new rent. All right, that's all I have to say. That's all I need.
Thanks, you guys. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have uh, the last two to get through. Um, we'll do this as quickly as we can because I know everybody is anxious to go home. Um, and we're on number 11. Okay, requires private sector emergency ambulance employees to remain on call during work breaks and changes other conditions of employment, which I will get to. Should the labor code be amended to allow private ambulance employees to remain on call during work breaks and to exempt their employers from potential liability for violations of existing law regarding work breaks? Okay, this is an initiative statute. Um, it requires private sector, there are, there are private sector ambulance companies and then there are public. And this is only applies to the private sector emergency ambulance employees. Um, it requires them to remain on call during their work breaks, provides additional preparedness training for employees and those preparedness trainings are primarily in, um, uh, unfortunately, what we're starting to see more and more of, you know, um, mass shootings, things of that sort. Um, Provides emergency medical crews with mandatory mental health coverage as well as yearly mental health and wellness training. And this is in response to um, the, in, the intensity of the job of um, emergency medical service people uh, and their feeling as though they need to have uh, additional support with mental health. So currently, California counties oversee the local emergency medical services. Private ambulance providers contract to perform emergen emergency medical services in a specific area. Ambulances are geographically positioned, and when an ambulance is dispatched, others are repositioned to take over for it. The emergency medical service personnel remain on call during unpaid work breaks, but they're often interrupted by 911 calls or what's called repositioning, which is what I just explained. The California Supreme Court ruled in 2016 that the private security guards, different from medical people, private security guards on unpaid break are off duty and uninterruptible even in an emergency. Okay, so, so, do, I, do you want me to explain that again? Okay, so the EMS personnel, EMS Emergency Medical Services, um, they're similar to private security guards. And so what happened is that some lawsuits started to develop um, from emergency medical service people um, because, what they, because what was happening is that um, they were not getting paid. They were not getting paid um, when they actually had to respond when they were uh, on their break, when they were so-called on their break. And so some of these lawsuits have developed as a result of wanting to get the payment back for pays that, for uh, salaries that were not paid um, when they were, when they were actually working during their breaks. So because they're similar um, and these, these lawsuits are now pending, um, the part of this bill would, would take actually uh, that liability, it would, if this passes, it would take that liability that the um, lawsuits are asking of the emergency medical uh, companies, it would nullify that. Um, providers estimate needing 25% more ambulances to meet this requirement um, because they would have to, they would have to add additional ambulances to cover when people are taking their breaks and they're, they are not, we are not able to, call on them during an emergency. Okay, so the purpose is to amend state labor laws to allow the private ambulance employees to remain on call throughout their entire shift, including paid breaks. So they would have to respond no matter what, anytime. Additionally, it would require providers to provide ambulance employees with this additional training that I just mentioned, um, and up to 10 paid mental health services per year. Um, it is estimated that tens of, they, well, they don't know for sure, but they, they estimate that it's tens of millions of dollars that are going to be saved um, if this passes. And, um, you know, that, that's a result of not having to actually pay uh, 
the liability if those lawsuits are successful and also um, not having to bring in all of the additional uh, ambulances to uh, cover while people, people are on break or uh, actually additional employees while people are on break. If the law remains and is applied to emergency medical service personnel, it's estimated to increase costs by 25% to maintain appropriate employee and ambulance coverage. Pros, it maintains the industry practice for ambulance workers to remain reachable during work breaks in case of an emergency. This is the same for firefighters and police. It ensures that 911 emergency care is not delayed and it provides emergency medical crews with the mandatory uh, medical health coverage and yearly mental health and wellness training. There were no cons submitted to this. Support for the proposition, um, emergency physician, an RN, former director of LA County Emergency Medical Services Agency, and a licensed paramedic. There was no argument submitted against it. So there are arguments against it, and, um, uh, but, there, but there was no organization that rallied around this, and so um, there's nothing on the official ballot. But you can, if you go and Google this, you can see what people are saying about um, why, they, why they would oppose this. Top donors are the American Medical Response, which is the largest ambulance company who is hiring all of these people and paying for, and, and is also under these um, lawsuits. $21 million, a little over $21 million for that. None raised in opposition. So your vote, a yes vote, um, allows ambulance providers to require workers to remain on call during breaks, um, paid at their regular rate, requires employers to provide additional training for emergency medical technicians and paramedics, and requires employees to provide uh, emergency medical technicians and paramedics with some paid mental health services. A no vote, none of that happens. No, nothing happens. And that's it. So we're on our very last one. Um, and that is number 12, and that's Michaela King. Michaela is the niece of Lyndon, who was just up here a little bit ago. Yeah. Oh, she's her. Lyndon's her niece. <laughs> she's not. Well. <laughs> yeah. That is okay. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I just want to say thank you all for being here. I'll make this very brief as it is getting late. Then shut half the lights off. Um, but thank you for participating and, and taking the time to learn about this stuff that is not sometimes the most exciting. But it's really great to have you here. I will just say quickly too that obviously since we don't have time for questions, if you did fill out a card, please leave it um, on the table in the back and we will collect them. Additionally, if you would like um, any other information, uh, we are willing to take some questions on social media so you can find the League of Women Voters of Western Nevada County on Twitter and Facebook, Instagram if you want to shoot us a picture. Uh, I am the social media chair and we would be happy to answer questions on into the weekend. Um, as Janice said at the beginning, we are not experts, we just have taken some more time than the average Joe to look into these things. So we welcome your questions on the internet. Uh, Proposition 12 um, establishes um, new confinement standards for um, animals, um, for farm animals, especially for the sale of meat and eggs. Um, it is a um, initiative statue. Um, let's see. Yes, it was put on the ballot, um, or it's on the statue for November of this year. Um, the ballot summary basically states that it'll establish new minimum requirements for egg-laying hens, veal calves, and pork. Um, it has a lot of details to it about square footage, which I will not go into at this point, but again, if you have some questions. Basically, um, it is a little different from Proposition 2 that passed in November of 2008, which basically said that animals need to be able to turn around and not be in a an actual crate. This extends that or changes that to they need certain square footage um, of living space. So like 43 for veal calves and 24 for pork and one square foot for laying hens. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so it's a specific number of square feet, and it, it kind of implements the law on the sale of these items, of the sale of the meat so or eggs. So rather than enforcing actual, it seems like the verbiage is, rather than enforcing actually the farms and how they are raised, it enforces the sale of that. It cannot be sold if it doesn't comply with these standards. So that I felt like was an important piece of verbiage in there. Um, the fiscal impact is not really known. They assume that $10 million will be spent to enforce this and an unknown amount of revenue lost in taxes by farmers decreasing um, their output um, and also the sale of those items. Veal and pork aren't huge uh, industries in California, so this mostly affects the egg farming industry. Um, so that is the potential fiscal impact. The pros of this are to strengthen and clarify California's old um, animal cruelty laws, uh, prevent egg-laying egg hens and pork and calves from being housed inhumanely, uh, to reduce the risk of people possibly sickened by factory farming. Uh, the cons are, as we mentioned, the potential loss of revenue um, and the cost of up to $10 million, and that consumer prices may rise uh, due to these standards being increased. Um, there are a lot of associations and officials in support of this. Um, it was put on the, on the ballot by the um, Humane Society um, under their Californians again, or sorry, under Prevent Cruelty California. They have raised the $6.12 million pretty much single-handedly. Um, all these other people support, but not much fiscally. Um, and then the people in opposition are a few. Californians Against Cruelty Cages and Fraud is a sort of combination of farming um, associations. Um, PETA is also opposed to it because they don't think it is extensive enough. Um, that was their take on it. Um, so a yes vote would support this. Oh, sorry, do you want to go back to the 6.2? Okay. So <laughs> yes vote on this supports banning the sale. So that is the verbiage again, banning the sale of meat and eggs from calves raised in, um, for veal, breeding pigs, and egg laying hens that are confined in areas less than the specified square footage per animal. Um, a no vote opposes banning the sale of that. And for more information, again, Voters Edge, Ballotpedia, League of Women Voters webpage has everything you might also need. So thanks again for coming. Good night. And, and if anybody has questions, we do have our presenters here still. So if you want to ask anything, if they're willing to hang out a little while, we can do that. Um, I just wanted to say, too, thanks again to the NU debate team. And they do have a fundraiser. They went home because it's a school night. <laughs> but they do have a fundraiser this weekend on Saturday. It's at Nevada Union. Um, it's a yard sale. So basically, they've collected a lot of donations. So you can just go and maybe find cool stuff. And that's from 7 to 1 on Saturday. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Don't forget to vote. Vote, vote, vote.